make this country the greatest place to live, to raise a family, to start a, a business, to send your kids to school. And if I come back here with a working majority in Parliament, then I will get Parliament working again for you. Hello, Mr. Boris Johnson. How are you doing? Oh, hi. Who is it? It's it's carol singers. Well, I got in trouble for for being filmed putting the tea keeping the tea bag in. What would you say to someone who's wondering who to vote for in this election? I would say it is a very, very simple choice. We can do one thing that no other party can do at this election. You know what it is? You know what it is? I thought you might know what it is. No flies on you. We can get Brexit done. Now, in a few moments, polling stations across the United Kingdom will close. The voting will be over and we'll be able to reveal the result of our exit poll. That's our first hint of the possible result. So as Big Ben reaches 10 o'clock, we are standing by with those crucial exit poll figures. Here they are. Yes! Our exit poll is suggesting that there will be a conservative majority News, if you're just joining us here on election 2019, at 8 minutes past 5 in the morning, is that the Conservatives are now past the finishing post. They have won a majority in this campaign, and that is the formal result for us. Well, conference, what happy memories. And doesn't it feel fantastic to be back here again at a real Conservative Party conference? Yay! And I'll tell you, we all know the wonders of modern technology that helped us stay connected during the darkest days of the COVID pandemic. But I tell you, conference, Man cannot live by Zoom alone, and, and there really is no substitute for being right here, gathered together for the first time since Boris Johnson led us to a historic general election landslide. Yeah. And thanks, conference, to all of you, you made it happen. And of course, to my brilliant predecessors, James Cleverly and Amanda Milling. But for me, conference, this is really a very special moment. I grew up in the Conservative Party. I was a member of staff of the Conservative Party. And today, I am truly honoured to be the new chairman of the Conservative Party. But I'll tell you why. Not just because we're the oldest and most successful political party in the democratic world. Not just because we have led this country through some of the most significant events in its history. Not even because we have developed policies that have spread prosperity to millions of people. It's because I know, and you know, that this is a fundamentally decent party. Yeah. Now, you may not hear it from our opponents, but I see it every single day. Our councillors who tirelessly serve their communities, the many thousands of members and volunteers for whom support for our party is just one part of their contribution to civic life. From fundraising for hospices, 
to running dementia cafes, to serving as school governors and joining the army of COVID volunteers in our hour of need. You are the backbone of our nation. And our service is shaped by our values. We believe that everyone deserves the best possible start in life. And that means a decent education, like the one I was fortunate enough to receive from my local state school. That means decent health care, free at the point of delivery, from which my family and I have benefited time and time again, thanks to our fantastic NHS. And that means decent opportunities to live and work in safe and pleasant communities. The Conservative Party that I believe in is moderate, pragmatic, and open. We hold true to our values, but we're never dogmatic about how we apply them. And to be an effective party of government, we have to translate these policies and these values into government and to deliver on them. Put simply, we have to get on with the job. And we're doing that with education, where bold reforms initiated by Michael Gove have transformed our schools. And where Nadim Zahawi, our vaccine program hero, will deliver the outstanding schools that our children deserve. And we're doing it with health, where we've chosen to massively invest in better hospitals, more doctors, and more nurses. Now, the vaccine program showed what we can achieve in an emergency. But responsible government also demands that we tackle and resolve long-term ingrained problems. Ones that previous administrations have put to one side as far too difficult. Well, fortunately, I think you all know that in this Prime Minister, we've got someone who's not afraid to be bold. And uh, that's exactly what he's done. This government has grasped the nettle of delivering sustainable funding for our social care system. It is this Conservative government that will at last remove people's fear of having their own home sold from underneath them because of the cruelty of that lottery of dementia. But conference, unlike some other parties, we also know that first-class public services can only be paid for by a strong economy and by free enterprise. And it's our very good fortune that in Rishi Sunak, we have a world-class chancellor to guide us through these tough times and on to that better future. Britain, yes, what a marvelous chancellor he is, conference. And Britain, thanks to him and to all the efforts of the British people, now has the fastest growth in the G7. Unemployment has fallen for seven consecutive months. Wages are rising. Our entrepreneurs and innovators are creating more billion-dollar tech firms than France and Germany combined, all underpinned by that most basic and important conservative instinct, sound public finances and living within our means. This conference is a conservative government delivering on the people's priorities. But of course, no government is perfect. And I would like to think that at least we have the wisdom to listen to people and the humility to learn how we can do better. That's why we are going to look again at our planning reforms. Of course, our opponents, particularly the Liberal Democrats, have shamelessly stoked fears that changing the planning system will lead to ugly and disproportionate de development. I certainly don't believe that. And I can tell you that if we were to rip up controls in Hartsmere, where I represent, my constituents would have a thing or two to say about it. But I'm afraid it's no good just saying to voters in places like Chesham and Amersham, trust me, I'm a politician. <laughs> uh, we've tried it. Yes, of course, Britain's growing population must have new houses. 
but it's clear that additional safeguards are needed. We do need to set out in law measures to protect our towns, villages, and precious countryside from being despoiled by ugly development. So conference, watch this space. But conference, questions about our values run much deeper than that. Do we believe at heart ours is a decent country, a country of rule of law, democracy, and freedom, where people who work hard, do the right thing, can get on in life and provide for themselves their family, and their community. Where genuine problems and injustices are tackled with energy and good faith. Now, my answer, and I'm sure I know your answer, is a resounding yes. But that's why I am so saddened by a small but very vocal group that profoundly disagrees they see a completely different Britain, dominated by privilege and oppression, that should view its values and history with shame. A mantra that results in bullying and haranguing of individuals, elected representatives, and public institutions. That so-called cancel culture. And we've all seen this simplistic narrative in action. Divisions are heightened, statues torn down, history rewritten, but conference, I'm afraid it's actually much worse than that. Anyone who dares resist this argument, anyone who objects to this woke aggression, is branded as instigating culture wars. It's quite extraordinary. Like our equalities minister, Kemi Badnock, who has suffered relentless abuse from the left. Kemi, we are with you all the way. Because I saw firsthand in my previous role the damage those campaigns can do to our precious institutions. That's why we must be robust in empowering them to stand up to this bullying, to defend the interests of the taxpayers who ultimately fund them, and to keep our national heroes like Nelson, Gladstone, and Churchill in the places of honor that they deserve. Now, you might imagine that a responsible opposition party would be only too keen to demonstrate to the British people that it is on their side against this argument. But I'm afraid that actually the opposite is true. Today's Labour Party has got woke running through it like a stick of Brighton rock. And, and Labour's problems go far wider and deeper than Jeremy Corbyn's faction. To prosper in the Labour Party, you must today, at some level, endorse this worldview. Now, previous generations of Labour leaders, activists, and voters would have looked in dismay at what Labour has become. It used to be the party of the workers, proud, patriotic, and practical. Men like my grandfather, Harry Dowden. Red Harry, as he was known, worked in the rail yards of North London and was a trade union rep for the National Union of Railwaymen. He was actually a labor man through and through. His worldview was forged by the Great Depression and the war. But he was also a patriot. He loved Shakespeare and he loved reading about history. And conference, if you want to know why Labour Party lost the last general election so very badly. It is because so many of the children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren of people like Harry Dalton in communities up and down the country believe that Labour has turned its back on them. Yeah, yeah. But the difference between our parties is also to be found in our tolerance. A recent study found that half of Labour voters 
would think badly of friends or family voting Conservative. But only one in seven Conservative voters said the same thing about a loved one voting Labour. You know, it's so much easier to get along with people when you believe that they at least have good intentions, even if they're profoundly wrong. It's, <laughs> and they are profoundly wrong, conference. But you know, it's so much harder if you're so puffed up with your own moral certainty that you think that those that you disagree with are wicked, or dare I say at conference, scum. Another difference is that we respect democracy. When we lose, we take it on the chin, we regroup, and we move on. Of course, in 2016, we had that momentous referendum in which Britain voted to leave the EU. As it happens, I was on the losing side. But it never crossed my mind for a moment to dispute the result. Instead, I vowed to do my bit to deliver Brexit. And I tell you, I just wish people like Keir Starmer had done the same. And I also want to tell you this conference. At this place, you will hear different viewpoints debated in a civilized way. Now, you contrast that with last week in Brighton, when the Labour MP, Rosie Duffield, feared to attend her own party conference because she dared to dissent. And another Labour figure, I suspect, who didn't make it to Brighton is Councillor Theresa Norton. Instead, she was arrested four times as a leading figure in the blocking of motorways by climate change protesters. Now, of course, millions of ordinary Britons, like all of us, we care deeply about climate change. But when people are working hard to rebuild their livelihoods after COVID, the last thing they need is arrogant Labour activists blocking their access to their homes, workplaces, and hospitals. But don't worry, conference, I can assure you our fantastic Home Secretary, Priti Patel's new policing bill and powers will curb these irresponsible antics. <laughs> but let me end with this pledge to all of you, my fellow Conservatives. The Prime Minister gave me this job so that I could be your voice around the cabinet table, in the media, at the campaigning coalface, I'm here to represent all of you. I'm also here to get our party machine ready for the next general election, whenever it comes. <laughs> We're already doing so, and thanks to my fantastic predecessor, Andrew Millen, we started this process. We are hiring great new staff to build the new team to win. We're recruiting 50 campaign managers right now. We're beefing up the by-election capability, mapping the battlegrounds, harnessing the most advanced digital and data techniques from all over the world. But I know, and you know, that we can only win, we can only deliver this with your hard work and your support. And we will give you the very best tools for victory. And of course, I'm sure you're all thinking at this stage, well, how are we going to pay for all of this? Well, I'll be working with a man who has delivered the firepower for the last general election, my brilliant co-chair, Ben Elliott. <laughs> and conference, we'll do this, not just for our party, but for our country. That is the Britain that I knew and I grew up in. It's the same Britain that is admired around the world. A country where if you work hard, you can get on and provide for your family and your community. Our values are the values of this nation. Moderate, decent values translated by our Prime Minister and our government into a program that delivers for Britain. So conference, let's get on with the job.
conference. It's an honor to be appointed Foreign Secretary. We have much to be proud of. Under the leadership of our Prime Minister, we're delivering for the United Kingdom and we're delivering for the world. The Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine is being rolled out in record time. It's being produced in countries from Mexico to India to the benefit of people across the globe. We're striking new trade deals around the world, championing innovation and enterprise and supporting development. Britain has always been a lodestar of freedom and democracy. But these freedoms need to be advanced, particularly at a time of immense global change. The democratic world order faces a stark choice. Either we retreat and retrench in the face of malign actors, or we club together and we advance the cause of freedom. We need to rise to meet this moment, and today, I will explain how our foreign policy will create a better Britain and help exert our global influence in the fight for freedom. My vision is to strengthen our economic and security ties in order to build a network of liberty around the world. We will have a positive, patriotic, proactive foreign policy that expands our trade routes, strengthens our security partnerships and supports development. We want to trade with and invest in more countries to our mutual benefit, which leads to freer and wealthier societies, aligned to the cause of liberty, spreading the human rights and the values that we believe in. We must win the battle for economic influence. And this starts with forging closer ties with our friends and allies across the world, including the G7 and NATO, our Pacific partners like Australia, Japan and Mexico, the great democracy of India and our friends across the Commonwealth, Israel, South Korea, the Gulf states, those countries who escaped the USSR and fought for freedom, the so-called Visegrad Four and the Baltic Three, and of course, our vital strategic partner, the United States. Conference, we can only challenge malign actors from a position of strength. And we will deliver this through better security, better trade, and better development support. On security, we're striking new pacts to protect our sea routes, trade routes, and freedoms. AUKUS, our new partnership with the US and Australia, will help Australia acquire nuclear-powered submarines to defend their territorial waters. We're in talks with Japan about better military access and operational support between our two countries. We want closer security ties with key allies like India and Canada, who we can collaborate with to fight in cyber and improve our defense capability. And we're demonstrating all of this through the visible armed presence of our carrier strike group. We're spending more than 2% of GDP on defense, the biggest since the Cold War. I want our allies from the Baltic to the Tasman to know that Britain stands with them and that together we will stand up to our adversaries and promote the cause of freedom. On the economy, we believe in working with our friends and allies and helping countries grow through enterprise and infrastructure investment. We've struck deals covering 68 countries on trade and we're deepening trade routes with the world's fastest growing economies. The Trade Secretary is negotiating advanced deals with India, Mexico, Canada, Israel, the Gulf and more. We're the first country to negotiate entry to the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And we want more like-minded countries to join us in that agreement. We're working with allies like the US and Japan to finance clean infrastructure in developing countries that is reliable and honest. This will boost jobs and growth here in Britain. And it will mean those countries are not subject to strings attached agreements with autocratic regimes. We're working on new tech deals with the US and Singapore because we want global technology standards to be shaped by freedom-loving countries, not by authoritarian regimes. On development, I will be focusing on women and girls. I want to make sure male girls get a quality education. I want to take on the appalling practice of female genital mutilation 
and I will make it my mission to end the abhorrent use of sexual violence in wars around the world. We will build coalitions of the willing to advance these causes, and we'll be tough on those who don't share our values and don't play by the rules. It's important we trade with China, but we must make sure it's reliable trade, that it avoids strategic dependency, and that it doesn't involve the violation of intellectual property rights or forced technology transfer. The world is safer and more prosperous when countries abide by their international obligations. And we will reach out to more countries who haven't historically been aligned to Britain and encourage a freer, more prosperous world. As Mrs. Thatcher said in her Guildhall speech just days after the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, the message is clear. When people are free to choose, they choose freedom. And we need to give countries across the world that choice. The freer a country is, the wealthier it is. The more secure it is, the greener it is. It's less likely to harbor terrorists and radical fundamentalists. It's less likely to have huge migration outflows. And it's less likely to go to war. Freedom enables businesses to flourish. It enables people to flourish. It enables girls and women to flourish. It's the best way to influence the world and to tackle the great issues of our age. It's also the way that we will build a more competitive, more confident Britain. Deeper trade links mean more jobs in the Scotch whisky industry, the car industry in the Northeast, the tech industry here in Manchester. Our AUKUS agreement will make Britain safer and it will create hundreds of jobs from the shipyards of Govan to the factories of Tyneside. Our new cleaner, greener investment into developing countries will mean more jobs for British architects, engineers, and technologists. This is the work I will do as Foreign Secretary, banging the dumb drum for Britain abroad to deliver for people here at home. Britain has always been at its best when we've been an outward-looking, confident, optimistic nation, confident in our ability to compete and lead. This is the Britain I want us to be, patriotic and positive. That is why people voted for our Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, with such an overwhelming majority in 2019. And it is a fundamental point about Britain that the Labour Party has never understood. People want to feel proud of their country and their local area. They want to see Britain doing well on the international stage. They're fed up with the talk of decline and the sneering about our place in the world. Last week at their conference, Labour members voted against the Australia-US submarine deal, showing just how out of touch they are. I know that other countries have huge trust in Britain and they want to work with us. They're enthusiastic for everything from our Premier League to our music to our brilliant products, like our cars, fashion, and food. We're a great country, a successful, modern, liberal, free enterprise country that time and time again has stood up to despots and tyrants. We've led on the emancipation of minorities. We're one of the best countries in the world to be black, a woman, or LB LGBT. And we can be proud of our record. And yet, despite this, there are those on the left who believe in the moral equivalence between Britain and our adversaries. Jeremy Corbyn may no longer be leader of the Labour Party, but the same spirit lives on. And this moral relativism translates into attitudes here at home and has given rise to a creeping illiberalism that threatens our fundamental freedoms. Freedom starts at home. And we need to win the fight for freedom here in Britain. And that means, as Conservatives, that we will stand up for free speech. We'll stand up for a free press. And we'll give everyone across Britain the opportunity to succeed, regardless of their background. We reject the zero-sum gain of identity politics. 
We reject the illiberalism of cancel culture, and we reject the soft bigotry of low expectations that has held so many in our country back. We're focusing on the questions that keep people up at night. Can my child get a good education? Do I have good access to public services? Am I free from discrimination in my office or on the shop floor? These are the bread and butter equality issues that people really care about. And we want to make sure that Britain is more competitive, bolder, more forward-leaning than any other country on earth. And the best way to advance our aims is to deepen our economic partnerships and build this network of liberty. By doing so, we will support freer and better societies across the globe to the mutual benefit of Britain and the world. I reject the voices of decline. I believe that Britain's best days lie ahead of us. And we will put the UK at the heart of a network of economic, diplomatic and security partnerships. We will help other countries grow through enterprise and trade. And we will make our country more competitive, safer and freer. This is how, as Foreign Secretary, I will ensure that our foreign policy delivers for everyone across our great country.